Okay, cool. Yeah, so as you guys already introduced, uh, I will talk a bit about how we migrated our design org to Figma. Uh, and I was kind of try to go through a couple of things we learned uh, throughout the way. Um, so uh, before we start, uh, <laughs> I just want to talk a little bit more about me. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, I'm a designer from Sweden, uh, from a small town called Sundsvall. Uh, but I've been living in uh, Bangkok for the past 10 years and working here. Uh, I grew up with a mom who had a very strong passion for uh, interior design and arts, and my dad was an IT consultant, so I kind of arrived somewhere in between the two, I guess. <laughs> uh, but uh, my mom's kind of passion for design really sparked a curiosity in me from a very early age. Uh, so I started to play around with it, and uh, especially uh, I really like to play around with Photoshop. And since I also like football or soccer, as they would call in America, um, I started to do football jerseys for a video game, uh, just for fun, but this kind of consumed most of my spare time in my teenage years. Um, and after that, I, I thought it was so exciting and so much fun that I kind of wanted to apply for a design program in high school. Uh, so I did that for three years, and I just get to learn a bit about the basics on uh, web design, uh, 3D photography, graphic design, etc. And... Uh, yeah, I definitely knew at that point that this is what I want to do in life, but I thought uh, I want to kind of um, broaden my skills a little bit. So I decided to join a college. I decided a computer science program. <laughs> and after about six or seven months, I figured, nah, probably not for me. <laughs> so I kind of dropped out. Um, but luckily for me, uh, at that time, I was offered a job at uh, our local newspaper. Uh, to do like the advertising in-house. So I thought, okay, if I can earn money and I can still work with design or I can continue to study something boring that I don't like, let's just do the design work for now. I can always come back to the school, right? Uh, I didn't. <laughs> uh, instead, I moved to Bangkok and uh, I joined a Swedish company over here. And first I worked in a help desk for a few months, but eventually I moved over to the product team. And I kind of did a mix of UI, uh, iconography. I did uh, product manuals, logos, pretty much anything design that they needed, I provided. And uh, eventually I actually get to take over that product team. So I ended up leading a product team with uh, front-end and back-end developers for about five years until I moved to Agoda. So this is where I currently work. Uh, I've been here for about three and a half years. And uh, Agoda, for those of you who don't know, we are one of the biggest online travel agencies in Asia. And uh, those of you in Europe, because I saw on the map that a lot of you are in Europe indeed, uh, we are a sister company to Booking.com. So uh, Booking.com takes care of a lot of the markets back in Europe and US, and we have the bigger share in Asia. Um, so the design org at Agoda, we have about 50 plus designers in different capacities. So there are uh, visual designers, product designers, UX researchers. We have design engineers, uh, design leads, and managers. And the product team is very fast paced, right? So we launch about 100 new experiments every week. And we always run uh, more than 1,000 different experiments across our different platforms at any given moment. So that means that there's sort of like an endless combination of uh, experiments that our users interact with every single time. Um, just give me a second. So <clears throat> in order to support this for the company, we have kind of divided our design team into different business units and different products. Uh, so we have a couple of teams, for example, working on our consumer facing products. Uh, and we also have teams working on enterprise, uh, internal tools that we build for our coworkers and design engineering team. And of course we have the science systems team as well. And what happened about a year ago was that a lot of us started to hear more and more about Figma and you know, get really curious about the tool. Uh, also our sister company, booking.com had already done their migration a year ago. So we figured we wanted to give it a try. So there was a couple of people uh, across these different teams who are particularly curious. So we decided to kind of come together and make this new sort of team that we call the Figma action team. Uh, or the FAT team, as we call it sometimes. Um, so we started to play around with the tool and uh, you know, 
see how it worked for us. We actually shipped some designs to our developers and uh, product managers. And uh, the conclusion after about a month or so was that uh, Figma was indeed going to be a better option for us compared to Sketch and Abstract. Um, so we wanted to move ahead with a migration. But before just jumping right into it and moving everything to Figma, we sort of wanted to reach out to our teammates across all of these different teams to sort of cover all the different uh, angles uh, in order to kind of set ourselves up for success. So we did interviews and we talked to everyone about, you know, how do they work today? Uh, what are their pain points? Uh, what are some things they like with the existing process with Sketch and Abstract uh, and Zeppelin? And what are some things that could be improved? What doesn't work? And uh, whilst uh, there were definitely positives, uh, <laughs> what we uncovered after talking to all these people uh, was that there are quite a lot of issues that people have been kind of annoyed about and that has slowed people down for a very long time. And we kind of realized that just moving from one tool to another was not really gonna cut it, uh, but we actually have to improve the way we work. Um, so based on all this intel that we gathered, we set up a couple of goals to kind of guide us in the right direction when we moved from Sketch to Figma. So <clears throat> the first goal that we set up was to make, more, uh, make work more efficient. Uh, we wanted to reduce all the unnecessary steps and admin work that the designers kept doing with all these other tools. And we wanted to enable them to basically focus on designing. And number two, uh, we wanted to increase visibility and collaboration. Uh, we think it should be really easy to provide feedback, uh, to receive feedback, uh, and kind of to naturally uh, get exposed to each other's work in the day-to-day -day work. The third goal we set up was to make our system more straightforward, but also more scalable. So we wanted to be super easy for both designers across different teams, uh, and also product managers and developers and all kinds of stakeholders to you know, find the right thing in Figma uh, quickly. And as priorities in the company might change, we of course want the system to sort of uh, scale for that as well in different ways. So we don't sort of paint ourselves into a corner. Um, that sort of happened with Abstract. Uh, there was no kind of organization. Everyone just got started and got excited when we migrated to that many years ago. And it kind of became a, a bit of a mess. <laughs> so, Another thing that we thought was important after talking to our designers was to find the right balance of structure and artistic freedom. Uh, you know, we want people to do things, uh, to design things in the best way for them. And we cannot, uh, you know, know exactly what that is. But at the same time, we need to get a better structure for the team. Um, so if I fast forward about a year till today, uh, since we started this, what I kind of learned is that we sort of prepared a lot of things within our files, a lot of different workflows and ways that we thought everyone should work. But we sort of realized since then that, you know, like people know best themselves how they want to do their work. So uh, we sort of removed a lot of these kind of um, steps and it's a bit more free flow now. However, outside of the, outside of the files, uh, what we realized was that the initial structure that we came up with uh, was not really working at all times. We needed to make it a little bit more rigid uh, and add a little bit more clarity to how we want to work with each other. So um, therefore, I've decided to talk today a little bit more about the work that goes on outside of the files uh, within the Figma ecosystem. And it is a design conference. So <laughs> I think I'll start with organi uh, the organization of our design systems. I'll touch that briefly. Um, so what we have as a, with our org account in Figma is uh, one team for our design systems libraries. And within that team, we have a couple of projects. We have uh, design languages, we have web UI kits, app UI kits, et cetera, uh, icon kits, utilities to help designers work faster. So starting with the design language, uh, the way we sort of uh, split this up uh, for our team was to have um, a split on both platforms and on uh, the audience that we work with. So we have, uh, we have uh, design languages for both our app and web uh, products on the consumer side. And we also have app and web design languages for our uh, enterprise products. And then when it comes to the UI kits, uh, for all of them, we do usually have a core UI kit that contains all the basic components like buttons, 
um, you know, form fields, navigation, etc. But then for certain uh, products where this doesn't really uh, suffice, we also have extended kits like the flights UI kit or the enterprise UI kit. So for example, for enterprise products, we might me, uh, need more complex uh, form fields, data tables, uh, graphs, for example. And by keeping these separate, we make sure we don't really bloat the core kit because we want that to be very fast and easy to navigate for the majority of our designers. And so we keep them separate. And in addition to this, what we do is every month, we look at the stats for all our components in Figma, the stats that are provided uh, by Figma. And if we see there's a trend that certain components are barely being used, we make sure to get rid of them to not bloat the system. And similarly, we look at the different libraries themselves to see, you know, um, is there a steep drop in the usage of a particular library? Then that's a good reason for us to kind of dive into it and see why, you know, did we unintentionally break something? Uh, is it too hard to work with? Is there any other reason why designers suddenly stopped using it? Uh, so looking at the stats is something we do quite often as well. So this is sort of how it comes together. Uh, this is our Agoda Flights uh, product on our app. So as you can see, we have a lot of different libraries at play. We have you know, icons from the UI icons kit, uh, flight specific uh, UI components being used, airline logos from that library, uh, buttons and navigation and toggles, et cetera, from the uh, core UI kit. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit overview on the design systems, but uh, what I want to talk about next is really how we organize Figma uh, for all our product designers. So I'm going to look a bit more into the teams and the projects and the files that we typically use. So let's get started with teams. So here we have the top hierarchy of Figma, right? And there's so many different ways that you can organize this. Uh, and these were kind of the four different ways that we uh, evaluated for our team. So the first one is by reporting lines. So here, maybe we would have a team for each manager where they can sort of manage uh, their direct reports and all of that. The second one was by platform. So that we would have one team working on the web, uh, one on the app, mobile web, etc. The third one was audience. So here, perhaps we could sort of group our different products by uh, uh, audience such as our travelers, our hotel partners, our internal teams. Um, and the last one was by product. So simply just have one team for each product. And when we looked into this, we figured that amongst these first three, the first one that we kind of discarded was uh, the reporting lines. Because, you know, it's just hard for everyone in the company to know, like, who reports to who. No one's going to keep track on that. Um, and what if people leave, you know, what if we get new managers, reorgs, um, we don't think this would really work for us. So the second option was the platform. And here we feel like for a company like us, where most of our uh, products are basically app or web or mobile web, uh, this might not make sense because when we have those three teams, like that's where it stops. We cannot really scale it up anymore. So each of them would be very, very crowded with a lot of people, a lot of projects, et cetera. Uh, this might work really good for companies like Spotify or other companies who have, you know, like car UIs and smart fridges and Apple watches and whatnot, uh, but we don't really have that. <laughs> and similarly for the audiences, uh, we focus a lot on our traveler products. We want to provide the best experience for people who book flights and hotels. Um, so most users will be like designing within that product, uh, with that team, and the other ones will be, you know, not so many would have two or three more. So in the end, we decided to go for this option to organize the teams by product. So as you can see on the left here, we have uh, different teams for our stays, which is our hotels and homes. We have another team for flights, enterprise tool, our internal tool, etc. So we felt that the good thing with this uh, setup was that it works well for a larger team that has a lot of different products. Um, and it's easy to find and understand. You know, if you're a developer working on the flights product, it makes so much sense. You just go into the flights and you'll find your things. Um, and it can scale up and down very easily as well. You know, if we decide to uh, fund a new product, uh, we can easily add a new team. If we decide to sunset one of these products, we can easily just uh, archive it. Um, one little con with this, I guess, is the visibility between the teams. 
So if you have product designers working, you know, on the flight products and you have other designers working on the stays, uh, you don't really have those natural like sort of touch points where you kind of bump into each other's design as often. So there's a risk that they might get a bit diverged. So we have to do other things to kind of alleviate that. Um, and let's be honest, one big problem we've had with Figma since we migrated is the mix up of platforms because uh, we do have uh, app and web experiences within our teams, but in Figma, uh, you can only like enable default libraries uh, on a team's level. So you can only say that, okay, for this team, I wanna have the web library, the flights library, et cetera. But that means that each and every of our designer need to you know, remember to go into their uh, file settings and turn off those libraries that they don't want or turn on the ones they want. And this has kind of caused designers to use the wrong components a couple of times by mistake. So, you know, they thought they added a button from our app, but they were actually adding the, the button from the, the web library. So that's something we're still trying to figure out. And since we decided to base our teams on uh, products, we felt that it made sense to organize the products by feature. So for example, we have a search feature, we have a comparisons feature for our flights, and the pros for this, I would say, is pretty much the same. Uh, it's good for teams with many features. It's easy to find and understand, and it can scale up and down. Now, one thing that we really have uh, realized since we launched it, and we played around with this for a couple of months, is that it's not really <laughs> optimal for end-to-end -end design. So if you work on you know, holistic design changes across the board, full funnel, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a hassle. Um, you're going to have to add your designs on each of these projects, or you're going to have to find another solution. So uh, actually what we have done, uh, I'm not going to lie, uh, in some cases where it really made sense for us, we split our teams. For example, uh, we might have uh, flights on app and flights on web as two separate products. And for the same reason, sometimes we have different uh, features on different platforms uh, to kind of solve that problem. Uh, we felt that even if it's good to have a really nice structure and like it all makes sense in theory, if we see that things break in reality, there's no point to be stubborn and you stick to it, but better to just listen to the feedback from the team and, you know, find uh, the best solution that works for us. So that's the teams and the projects. So coming to the files, uh, the way we work in Agoda, is that we pretty much have three kinds of files for all our teams and all our projects. And first off is the master file. So this is where we manage our social truth. Uh, it's typically gonna be one file uh, per project since it's one per feature. So it's kind of easy to find. Uh, the second one is a ticket template. So here, the way we work in Agoda is that every single designer who works on any sort of improvement, they will have a ticket in Jira. So that's kind of how we uh, manage our time and you know how we build our roadmaps. So to have that kind of alignment uh, with Jira and Figma sort of made a lot of sense for us. Um, so that's one thing that we have the template that kind of helps to speed up work for designers. And then we have each and every design effort in its own file uh, separated. So this is probably the biggest change from abstract where everything was kind of a branch of a master file. Um, so definitely one of the cons working like this is to have like move these, uh, you know, designs from file to file, but I gotta say, uh, again, to be honest, abstract and sketch for us, it just didn't work that well. There were so many kind of stale branches in the end. Uh, we had so many merge conflicts, uh, things were just stacked upon each other. Sometimes there was an error. Uh, so even if it might be a little bit more uh, hassle to do it this way, so far, I would say it, the benefits have outweighed the cons for sure. So yeah, how that kind of comes together. Again, the teams are based on different products. They each contain different projects for the features. And each of these features contain usually a master file a ticket template to speed up work for designers and then a design ticket for uh, each design effort that we're working on. So now we kind of have decided how to set up the structure in Figma. So it's sort of time to put this all to practice with a team. 
And uh, here is kind of where we learn that even seemingly small design decisions throughout this process uh, and tweaks, they had a very big difference or they made a big difference for the designers, especially over time. You know, people are working with this every day and you have like, in our case, like 50 designers uh, spending a lot of time, even smaller tweaks make the big difference. So <clears throat> as an example, when we first set up our files, this is kind of the way we uh, structured it. So you see these thumbnails for each file, they had a lot of information. Um, we had this sort of color coded uh, background on each of these thumbnails to indicate whether a design was in progress, uh, if it was um, delivered to the developers or if it was live on the website. And uh, we also had a lot of links. We had links to our JIRA tickets, to the developers tickets, to the experimentation platform we used to track our design work and so forth. So there was a lot of information here. And what we kind of learned was that first of all, by having these uh, statuses color coded, it just made things really messy because you know there's no way for Figma to know which of these colors is what and to sort the files. So each and our projects kind of started to look a bit like a Christmas tree after a while <laughs> with all these colors. Um, and you know, whenever we wanted to change the status uh, on any given uh, project that we worked on, we had to open the file, we had to navigate to the right page, we had to select that frame, make sure to select the symbol, change the variant. And you know, it's just, it might seem like not that tedious, might just take a minute or two, but doing that multiple times on every single assign you work on, uh, it's just annoying for the team. And, you know, uh, people are lazy. Uh, they don't want to go through all that hassle. So that's definitely something that we wanted to fix. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, not being able to sort basically uh, was a big hassle here. So we decided to uh, take another round of this and uh, change things up a little bit. So the first thing we did was uh, we removed the color-coded backgrounds. Uh, it just didn't work for us. Uh, we also removed um, the links and basically any kind of information we had in our uh, cover thumbnails on Figma in the files uh, that people had to come back and update again and again. We wanted to make sure to get rid of all of those things uh, so that the only things we kept are the things that you can initially set up when you create your first ticket and then you can just leave it there. So we felt like now we had sort of removed a lot of things, which was great. Then we thought, okay, now we have a little room to add something as well. <laughs> so what we added here was these uh, ribbons. So we made these custom ribbons for each and every product team uh, in our organization uh, in order for them to sort of identify their own tickets in a project. And this is especially good for, you know, very crowded Figma projects where we have a lot of different teams helping out, working on the same feature. Uh, they can, you know, quicker uh, find their stuff in Figma. And another thing we did was we sort of did a revamp of the naming of all our files. So since we removed the status from the cover page, we decided to add it into the file name. So as you can see, we have like all these different statuses that are represented by uh, different emojis. So nowadays, these are like the first thing that we have in our file names. And they're followed by a timestamp. So the timestamp indicates whenever we started to work on the design in Figma. And then we have the Jira ID and we have the name from Jira. And for those projects where we do both app and web and mobile web uh, all in one project, we also kind of like to indicate uh, if a design is specifically for one of those platforms. So this is kind of how we reap the benefits from those changes. Um, so first of all, now that we sort our files based on name, uh, all of our files are automatically kind of grouped into each status. So you'll see all the design in progress will be at the top in Figma. And then you will have everything that we ship to our developers followed by things that have been live and taken uh, and so forth. So now it's kind of much easier to find the thing you're working on because if you know that you wanna find something that is work in progress, you just focus on the files on the very top. You don't need to bother about uh, the other things. And the timestamp also makes this sorted uh, chronologically. So if you know that you started something this quarter or quite recently, it's most likely gonna be the file in the very top. Uh, so less time spent browsing for files and more time spent designing. 
And this also works if you prefer the gallery view. Um, here you can kind of see these ribbons easier. So as you can see here, we have uh, all of the designs that are uh, in progress are on the top row. You can see that the latest file created this quarter is in the very first uh, file. Um, and then you can see, let's say that you're working on the loyalty team. So our loyalty team, they have this nice yellow ribbon. Here you can clearly see uh, your designs if you work in that team. And you can even see them across different statuses, right? It's the one in the top left and the one in the bottom right. So it's much quicker to identify. So this really helps us because we have on average about 30 files per project. Um, and we create about 200 new files every month in Figma. So just having a little bit more structure and thought about how we name things, uh, how we prioritize information has really helped for us. So now we have gone through the sort of general structure in Figma with the teams and the projects and the files. Um, so the next question is, how do we manage our source of truth, right? Um, I think it's crucial for us as a team to you know, be able to find the right uh, the latest design, uh, the relevant documentation. And I think if you get this right, it can possibly be the biggest time saver uh, in the day-to-day -day work for your designers. <clears throat> so in order to do this, uh, we have that separate file, as I mentioned, um, and it's located at the top. We make sure to always pin our master files to the top so it's easy to find. Um, and the way we sort of update this file, because I know a lot of companies have different sort of thoughts on this. Uh, our thought on this is that anything that has been designed, uh, shipped to the developers, built, tested on the platform, and 100% taken, those things goes into our master file. So we only want to integrate things that are considered the A side of any new experiments going forward. And those are the ones that are indicated with this nice green checkbox. So who's responsible? Well, um, at Agoda, we don't really have a dedicated team to manage these things. Uh, everyone is sort of already uh, assigned to a different feature or a different project. So what we did was we sort of distributed the responsibility of each of these files to a different designer. So for example, my good friend, Ali, she is responsible for the search feature on our app. And, you know, as an expert on this feature, uh, she's the go-to person for the rest of us uh, whenever we need support or a uh, second opinion. Uh, she also has a great overview of everything that is going on with her feature, and she can put us in touch with the right people if we need to. And uh, before I hand off any of my designs to my developers or my product manager, I just make sure to ping her for uh, her feedback if there's something, you know, that is a bit off that doesn't align with the rest of the product, so she can give that feedback before it's too late. And in the case there is a conflict that arises, maybe there are multiple designers working on different things, occupying the same space, or using different types of uh, UX for the same thing, she's also there to kind of uh, help us align, get together, and come up with a solution that works for everyone. Now, as I mentioned before, anything that has been integrated on our website is what we considered uh, part of our master file. So what the designers will do is that, you know, when they know that something has been launched successfully, they will rename the file to that checkbox, uh, but then they will also open the file and they will take whatever they handed off to the developers, they will copy it and they will add it into our master file. Um, and inside of these master files, we actually have a particular page called a master queue. Uh, so here you can see like all the different designs that have been integrated and they're like lined up and they're ready to go. And what we'll do is we'll ping Ali with a comment to let her know that, hey, this is now ready. You can add it to, you know, the page and integrate it. Um, so as I said before, Ali is a busy designer. She's working on the feature herself. So whenever she do have time, she'll come and have a look in this list. She'll see everything that is, you know, uh, has been implemented and she will audit it. So she'll make sure that uh, textiles are applied, that UI uh, kits are being used, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And she'll do any uh, necessary cleanup if there are, you know, like hidden layers or anything that can be uh, removed, she'll do that. 
and then she will take it and add it into the right place. So if there is a page, for example, for a certain feature, she'll make sure to add our designs in the right place and get it integrated correctly. Uh, and she will also do any sort of necessary documentation. And after that, she'll announce these changes to the team on our Slack channel so that everyone knows that now there's a latest version uh, live in Huma. Cool. So there's one more thing that I kind of want to go through uh, before I wrap this up. And that is the ticket template that I talked about before. So again, this is something that we always keep pinned up to the top of our projects for easy access. And this is something that we want our designers to duplicate when they start working on a new design effort. And uh, as you can see, we didn't just name this one like design templates <laughs> or something like that. Uh, we actually named it to this same naming convention that I walked through before. Uh, and the reason for that is two. First, obviously, uh, designers have to spend less time, you know, changing statuses and like adding emojis. They can straight away duplicate the file and we make sure to update these quarters and years uh, always. So they can just change the, the ID of the ticket and the name and they're good to go. And the second thing is, you know, by having this in the template, we make sure that people kind of stay aligned with the naming conventions that we have uh, added, just nudging people to do the right behavior in their day-to-day -day work. So what goes into the templates? Well, the cover thumbnail with those ribbons that I show you, they definitely go in here. So people don't have to go and find them. Um, then we also have a few checklists just to sort of help designers out to cover all their bases before they deliver stuff. So the first one is the align with the team checklist. So, you know, here we have, you know, the design systems, master file owner, QAs and developers, copywriters. Just, you can tick this off, you know, uh, to make sure that you have sort of aligned with them. And since we have this file for each and every project, we might actually know who is the copywriter for a particular feature or who is the you know, dev lead, QA, who is owning the file. So instead of just putting these like random uh, titles, we can actually put uh, the name of that person or a link to that person's uh, Slack profile. So you can quickly just tap it and open the Slack and you know, ask them or ping them with a Figma comment. The second one is quality handoff. So here, you know, uh, we just want to make sure that we deliver uh, a consistent quality, meaning that we're using the textiles, the color styles, uh, spacings and paddings, uh, and of course the UI kit components. And just by having this checklist here, even if designers don't like actively go and check things off, just by having it in the file, it kind of makes it harder for designers to skip it and then be like, oh, I didn't know, or like, it wasn't clear to me. Like, no, it was clear. <laughs> it was literally right there in your file. Um, what we also have in these templates, first of all, uh, these links that were removed from the cover thumbnail, we still have a space where designers can add them. So you can quickly access the design ticket in Jira if you want to read more about the requirements, etc. Uh, dev tickets, maybe documentation for the design system components, etc. cetera. Um, but we also provide this design critique template. So this is something we do in our design team uh, every week, uh, design critiques. So we have, I think, three or four different sessions and we have designers joining in from uh, different teams in the organization in order to get you know, uh, visibility on each other's work and a chance for people to both give feedback and receive feedback. And by having this as a template within the file that you're always working with, we sort of can make sure that the structure of these critique sessions are always uh, more consistent. And also designers can just you know, fill the gaps in this template. They don't need to create a new template or a new structure every time they wanna get feedback on something. They can simply just fill the gaps with you know, the data points that they're using, the problem status, uh, statements, the hypothesis, et cetera. And also by having it in the file, they don't really need to like copy paste all these strings, uh, add it to some presentation somewhere. Uh, it just helps to speed up work a little bit. And with all of those things in place, hopefully our designers can focus a little bit more on their design explorations, uh, delivering uh, kick-ass red lines, uh, et cetera and just focus a little bit less on admin and repetitive tasks. So some final thoughts before I wrap up the presentation. Um, 
something that we definitely have learned is that more processes lead to less adoption. <laughs> so, you know, uh, designers get work done in very different ways, right? Uh, each team that you work with have their own unique cultures, ceremonies, uh, ways to collaborate. Um, sometimes people think that you work in a company with many, many different teams. Like, what's the process, they might ask. And we're like, well, <laughs> it really depends who you ask, because each team build their own processes, more or less. We might use the same tools, and some of the same rituals, but in the end, there's so many other factors that kind of uh, makes up the way you work with, with other people, right? So it's kind of impossible for us to uh, account for all of these things. So rather than thinking of, you know, how do we add more processes? How do we, you know, like make sure that this and that doesn't happen again by, by adding more uh, rules? Something that I keep reminding my team about every time we discuss these things is uh, quite the opposite. Uh, how can we actually remove some things in order to keep focus on what's really important. And the second thing is to streamline as you go. You know, of course, do your due diligence, you know, read the articles, um, watch the conferences and all of that and come up with something that you think will work for the team. Uh, but I think once you have a good idea, uh, it's actually quite nice to roll it out, maybe at least with a small subset of your team and start to try the processes and the, the new ways you, uh, you intend to set things up and then start to monitor how these processes are being adapted. So, you know, if you see a low adaption on something, you see that shortcuts are being taken and hacks are being made. I think they're all good signs that the process either isn't necessary to begin with or that it can be simplified. Um, and one thing that I find really funny here is how, you know, designers tend to do these hacks but they also tend to hide them really well. Uh, it's almost like they think they are cheating or something. And I'm like, you're not cheating. You just found a better way to do something than I could think of in the first place. So <laughs> whenever this happened with the team, uh, we actually try to implement those hacks into the process instead. Um, and that way you also get your teammates more engaged. They see that you know, uh, you're not so stiff about, you know, rules and stuff like that, but you're more interested to, to get things going and, you know, to make things better. Uh, because you do want your designers to see the value in all of these things, right? You don't want them to, to think that all of this is just unnecessary time sinks, uh, that they would rather, rather do something else. And another thing to recommend is definitely to do some pulse checks with your teams uh, regularly to identify if there's any pain points. I think that's something we learned when we initially did this research with the rest of the team, when we we're gonna migrate. There were so many things that we uncovered, so many like big and small issues that people had to deal with every single day. Um, and had we just, you know, like, well, had we had a team like this before that, which we didn't, and had we just asked people, uh, we could have probably fixed some of them earlier. Um, and, you know, even with the best intents you have when you introduce new processes, um, there's always a risk that you unintentionally break something or you just make life a bit harder for someone. So by pulse checking, you can kind of uh, make sure to alleviate that. And as I said before, smaller tweaks can have a very big impact, especially over time and especially in bigger teams. And I do definitely want to be very honest. Uh, maintenance is time consuming. Uh, what seems like a perfect strategy from the beginning uh, in theory, might not always pan out that way in reality. You know, we're working with people, not robots, and time is scarce. Every single designer on the team have their own priorities, right? They have their things that they believe is the most important thing to do every single day. Uh, and that's also why I think, you know, uh, try to not go overkill on the processes uh, and sort of sympathize with the fact that people only have so much time uh, to, you know, go and update things. So you want to, that to be as lean as possible. And honestly, we are still trying to figure out the best way to do these things, how we can shave off even more time for our designers. Uh, and there's no manual for this, right? Um, so I'm super curious to hear uh, your feedback and thoughts. Maybe you guys have ideas to do this even better. Uh, yeah, please let me know. And I also just wanna give a big shout out to the team. Uh, as I said before, everyone is really busy doing like their product. Um, so to be able to carve out enough time to get this product uh, to where it is, the whole migration, uh, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of lunches. It took a lot of nights. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, and yeah, we're hiring. So 
if you guys are interested to move to Asia and come to Bangkok, uh, feel free to apply. Um, you can read more about the design team on agoda.design. Uh, you can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn if you are interested indeed to apply and you want to know more or you want any help. And we have a podcast as well, Design Explorers. So feel free to check that out and, and have a listen. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> wow, Alex, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Lovely presentation. Sylvia, are you yeah, uh, with your mic up? Amazing. So cool. Yes, and of course... I mean, look at that presentation skills. <laughs> <laughs> Such a nice, <laughs> lovely presentation. Love it. Yeah. Thank you so much for preparing all of the content and presenting today. A lot of good insights yeah. in there. Definitely. Yeah. And of course, we do have a lot of questions as well. Uh, yes, so... a lot, a lot. Are you ready? This is the most, take some time. Yeah, I'm ready. This is the most nervous part. This is like more nervous <laughs> than the flags and more nervous than the presentation. Uh, shoot. Oh. <laughs> well, Somebody just wrote, Alex, your presentation is worth the ticket price already. <laughs> oh. Oh, wow. oh. oh wow. yeah. It's a good way to wow. <laughs> It's a good way but, to start uh, a day, I, that's for sure. Please don't leave after Alex's presentation. We have a bunch of other really nice presentations as yeah. well <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> so yes uh, amazing be before i even start with the questions yeah there's a lot of people saying thank you really great uh, learned so much and amazing talk but you can read in the chat as well like all the the praises <laughs> cool i'll do so, it yeah. Uh, and also to clarify to everyone, I uh, as the talk was happening and questions were popping up on the chat here in Zoom, I pasted uh, what I could in the mirror board, but you're free to continue adding more questions to the mirror board as well as we are talking. And um, you also are able to raise your hand uh, here yes. in the Zoom call. We can uh, yeah open up the space for you to talk with Alex uh, directly. But yeah, is anybody, anybody who wants to go live? Just uh, do the reaction in Zoom with uh, raising your hand and uh, in or the meantime. Just type in the chat. Yeah. I want to go live. And um, then you can ask your, uh, your questions live and talk to Alex and us if you like, but you don't have to. <laughs> in the meantime, um, well, uh, the thing that got voted the most, actually, not so much as a question, but more of a request. Uh, somebody would love to see the ticket template. Uh, would you be okay with sharing it? <laughs> yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, I actually been pushing my team for this. Uh, I, I wanted to have this ready by this uh, conference, uh, but we're still doing some tweaks. So, uh, but yeah, believe me, I am pushing the team to get something uh, public for this. And uh, maybe I can ping you guys somewhere uh, whenever that's ready. Uh, but yeah, have a look out. Uh, have a look out on, I guess, my LinkedIn or on our website, uh, and I will definitely post it once once it's ready. It's our ambition to 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 live it for everyone for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, and in the same line of requests, um, not only people want to see the ticket template, uh, they would like also to see the example of the master file. Would you be able to show it, <laughs> like a sneak peek, maybe? Ooh. Oh, tricky, tricky, tricky. Uh, I, I, I would not on the call. <laughs> maybe I can come. Actually, uh, what I would recommend for this. So uh, maybe some of you have seen, but I did uh, write a couple of articles about this uh, a few months back. So if you check out my Medium profile, uh, you can find them there. And I believe on the second or th third part of this migration, uh, I actually have a bunch of screenshots uh, showing how these files work. So I always recommend you to do that. I, I, I don't want to get into any compliance issues showing stuff that we're not allowed to. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, check that out because there are actually uh, a bit more thorough explanations on, on that in the article. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I guess it doesn't hurt to ask, right? <laughs> no, of course. Of course not. <laughs> All right. We want to share as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so uh, actually, this was a question that uh, crossed my mind and I posted there in Miro. After the first time you organized the teams, how difficult it was to iterate and rethink the approach? Uh, yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I mean, so we've been working with this for almost a year now. 
and I think uh, how difficult it was. So I would say like this, it became very difficult to work with the first approach to the point where even if it was going to be a bit painful to reorganize and kind of tweak, it was still not as painful as if we were to continue working on it. Uh, I, it's not something that I would like just go ahead and do right away as soon as a problem arises. But if you see that there's like, you know, 10, 20 designers uh, complaining and they're not satisfied, I think that's, you know, like where we felt like, okay, come on, this is not just a, a isolated uh, opinion but it's starting to become a team problem. Uh, so yeah, we did have to spend some time doing that. Uh, it uh, was unfortunate, but I, I think it's impossible to, to not do it. If you're gonna be stuck with something that is suboptimal for the sake of, I don't know, uh, feel more proud of what you came up with initially, or you just gotta listen you know, to the team and, and keep iterating. It's, in the long term, it's worth it. We are saving so much more time uh, every single day now, like finding files, finding projects, dealing with those library issues uh, after we did this tweak. So again, even if it takes a little bit of uh, time to set it up and to get people like shifted, uh, yeah, definitely uh, worth it in a long time. Cool. Well, um, how do you make sure that the team is using a common language when talking about the system, including devs, PMs, etc.? Uh, yeah, that's another uh, great uh, question. So, well, one thing we do for sure is, uh, again, in the handoff process and in this template that we have, uh, we do definitely uh, make sure to, to tag our design systems designers uh, to make sure that they have, you know, a second look at things before we ship things. Uh, and if they're, so this, this do, does happen quite, uh, not quite optimal once in a while. Uh, if there isn't a component or if there's a reason why the existing components don't work, uh, there will usually be a, a quite lengthy conversation about that. And we'll, our design system designers uh, will try to help out and come up with a better solution where we can incorporate the design system. So that's an exercise that we do within the design team uh, pretty much any time uh, we're about to ship something and we don't use the libraries. Um, working with developers, uh, we try our best to align, you know, like the naming convention on our components, uh, the variants. We try our best to align this with uh, how it works on the technical side. We're kind of in the middle of a, of a project where we're going to uh, revamp this and do that even better. Uh, we also have an internal website for documentation where you can play around with these components and uh, make sure that you're staying aligned. But I wouldn't say it's trivial. It, it's not easy. And I think some companies uh, are probably a lot more mature when it comes to the science system. Our company is still, you know, there's a mix of legacy uh, work on our platforms and a mix of design components that are being used. So uh, yeah, uh, sometimes we do struggle to kind of uh, convince everyone to, to use the components, even if it means a little bit of refactoring, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's not super trivial always, that's for sure. All right. Well, I have a, an interesting one about Ellie. <laughs> so Ellie sounds like a saint. What processes do you have in place to ensure quality rather than Ellie having to clean up other designers files? Yeah. So, yeah. So again, like by, by trying to have each designer to, you know, uh, double check their, their, their work with uh, design systems, the page owner uh, and any other stakeholder. Uh, we sort of get 90% of those things fixed for sure. By the time Ali comes in and integrate it, it should already uh, have those things fixed. Uh, but how do we assure it? Uh, again, I would say it's this kind of really depends on, um, on the designer who owns the file. Uh, because to be honest, again, we, we don't have like a dedicated team for this. So some designers who might be more busy than others, they might also have a bit less time to... Uh, to do this due diligence. Uh, Ali, in this example, she is fantastic with this. Uh, she is like a design documentation guru. So I have no problem trusting her to do it. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think, again, uh, the struggles with time is, is usually the, the, the biggest kind of barrier from uh, assuring the quality. But I think within the design team, we, we are quite aligned that we definitely uh, need to adhere to our components. Our design systems team are very visible. 
they usually send out uh, newsletters with all the updates. They have like weekly calls with the whole team where they introduce like uh, where they show all the new components or improvements or whatever that they have done. So by making sure that they are very visible in the team, like people don't really forget about them and people will feel kind of bad about not using all of the work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's. Okay, so then I guess in the same uh, line of uh, where you're going at with explaining about the design system team, uh, there is a question about uh, who is responsible for publishing or updating the components in master file and how is the process behind it? Yeah, so that is the, the that page owner, Ali in this example, is uh, the owner uh, and she's the one to publish uh, the master files. On the design system side, it's, uh, I guess, a little bit different. Uh, but even there, we do have like one particular owner on each platform and each library uh, so that anyone can add stuff. But if we want to uh, publish the updates, it's always that one person to do it. Um, I guess there is the only exception for that is uh, we have sort of allowed every designer on the team to uh, go onto the master file. And if they find some like Say some issue if something is not using like auto layout or if something could be uh, done better, uh, then we do we tend to allow people to go in and change it uh, and tell them to be cautious. So it's not like how to say um, someone could go in and break it. That's for sure. Uh, but we feel like uh, the benefit of having people uh, coming in and helping out, knowing that each owner uh, you know uh, is very busy. I think that benefit outweighs uh, the benefit of having like a 100% strictly uh, successful uh, process every single time something gets upgraded. Uh, and we always have the versioning, right? So we could always like go back if, if someone screwed something up, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think personally, I've uh, well, being part of the design system team and sort of trying to uh, safeguard the, the libraries, uh, I totally understand, uh, yeah, the desire to be the one that um, controls and, and make sure that nothing breaks. So the only one to work on the design system, but at the same time, yeah, I completely agree with you. It's just the benefits of having everybody contributing just outweighs for sure this danger of getting things uh, messed up, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, what were the issues you found with files that had been converted to Figma? Uh, for example, did components break? Did the styles and link? Yeah, so <laughs> uh, here, uh, I think we all started by just, you know, dragging and dropping the files into Figma and having that auto conversion done. It's, it is amazing. Uh, it's very impressive how well it's done. Uh, but to be honest, I think 90% of the designs we actually had to rebuild anyways, because even if, you know, everything like is in place and visually it sort of looks correct, Still, like we felt that the biggest benefit with Figma is the way the tools kind of work. You know, having auto layout, having like all of these sort of uh, sort of tools that map a little bit more to you know the box model and how actual development work. Uh, it just meant that we had to redo them. So I, I think yeah, ninety percent of everything we sort of imported the files into Figma, and then we just kind of used that as uh, how to say like. Um, like a reference and then starting to build like the real thing next to it, uh, building the new components again, et cetera. So it's, uh, it was quite a lot of work in the beginning for sure uh, to get that done. And I would say that there are still files where there's a bit of a mix where we haven't really applied all of these uh, Figma specific uh, features. Um, but yeah, a lot of work up front uh, to do that. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's um, not as easy as just drag and dropping and calling it a day even you know it looks okay but <laughs> that's the that's the truth <laughs> yeah so does it mean that you had to set up uh, the design system libraries first or or you just like you had files and you had to rework those files and as you had to do those you were then adding new components how, how did it go yeah, uh, so the way we kind of rolled it out was that we actually had the whole design systems team uh, starting on Figma, like everyone got their licenses and set it up uh, about, I think, two months before the product designers. So after we decided that we wanted to do this, we had talked to the whole team. Uh, I think that was around like July last year. Then uh, we set up uh, a couple of milestones in August and September where the design system team had to get uh, each of the libraries ready. 
So we had, you know, like two weeks for the app system to be set up, two weeks for the web, et cetera. And then the whole team kind of worked together to get that live. And at the end of that deadline, we had this full kind of, we call it a Figma week, where we just launched it to the entire team. Everyone had a presentation on like how these things worked. So by then we needed to have these libraries uh, ready. And the reason why we did that was just because of this, you know, if we're going to have 50 designers uh, adding their sketch files into Figma and there's no support for any libraries or anything when they do that, I mean, come on, it's, it's going to be a mess. So yeah, by having that kind of staggered approach where you first introduce the design system to, to you know, prep everything uh, and then introduce the, the rest of the teams, uh, I think that saved us so much time. And, uh, and yeah, that's something I would recommend for other teams as well. Cool. And you were showing us some examples of like the file structure, the names, uh, and I guess that's where the, the question is coming from, uh, because that, that structure also helped to know versions. Um, but are you planning to move it into Figma branches when the feature launches? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, we just got access to that beta version like a few weeks ago, I think. and. Uh, I don't have an answer yet. Uh, we are currently, so the thing is we, the Figma action team that we kind of uh, started to work with, uh, we are meeting every other week to discuss, you know, any kind of improvements that we can do, any feedback from the team. And this is on our agenda. We have already talked about it like for two meetings, like where can we do this? Does it make sense? What problems does it solve? Because for us, and maybe it's just because we're sort of burned by uh, abstract, I don't know, but we are all kind of a little hesitant to just roll it out on the, the master files because we felt that, you know, even though merging like very obvious things like two different buttons or like two different things like uh, might work when there's a lot of, you know, like renaming of layers and hidden stuff and, you know, out to layout, I don't know, like it's just, we really want to try it out before we do it. I think for the design systems, for sure, it makes sense that we might start to use it uh, if we're going to do like a refresh or something like that, then for sure, that makes a lot of sense. And I do think that the page owners for the master files might want to do it uh, on the master file in case they're doing like a bigger update. If they really want to go in and, you know, update all the textiles and uh, using the auto layout, uh, you know, swapping out the symbols, then I think it makes sense. But uh, I don't really see it happening anytime soon that we're gonna uh, replace the file by file structure. Uh, we don't know how, how we're gonna search for the branches, how we're gonna sort them. Now we kind of already figured all of that out and I don't really have any answers to that for branches, uh, but I guess it's a challenge to the Figma team. <laughs> yeah, and also a valid point as well, indeed, to you have to rethink your entire workflow to adapt to something that also is right now on a beta version anyway. So yeah, yeah. Wh why spend the time trying to figure it out, a process for yourself when it will probably change anyway sometime soon, right? Yeah, and like, I mean, I love that they have this feature rolling out. I think it's an amazing feature. I'm not saying that it's not, uh, it's more that, you know, we gotta have a good reason for it first. What, what is it in the current process that does not work? Uh, and you know, is there a way we can fix that? Or does it suffice a complete revamp on the structure? Uh, meaning that we will have like thousand plus files <laughs> that we need to kind of uh, go and retrofit into this. So I think yeah. first there's gotta be a good reason. There's gotta be something that this feature has that the current setup doesn't. And right now uh, I'm not sure if they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, just a quick reminder, everyone, I'm going to continue reading questions. There is more questions for sure. But if you would like to raise your hand and ask uh, in, in a video or uh, with a, um, yeah, the sound on, just uh, feel free to raise your hand here. So moving on, uh, do you maintain your libraries manually or are they somehow automatically linked to the code? Uh, manually. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah, again, we are looking into uh, a bigger overhaul, but, you know, it's kind of for a bigger company with so many different tech teams and product team, it really requires another level of kind of orchestration to get both the tech side, uh, the design side, the product side uh, on board with it, uh, you know, get, because it will take resources to do that, right? And resources are always scarce. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, there, maybe you ask me in a year from now, maybe, <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, it's definitely a big challenge on a bigger team, I think, to to do that. Yeah. And how did you gather feedback from the team about the file structure and how much time did it take between uh, iterations? Yeah, so um, we have, first of all, we have a Figma uh, Slack channel where people can kind of give feedback or where we announce like different improvements that we do. So first of all, uh, a bunch of people in the design team had already kind of complained about it. And the second thing that wasn't really feedback, but more like we just saw that there was a lot of files uh, that weren't updated. So when we looked in our experimentation platform to see like which of these uh, design efforts uh, are live or which ones have we kind of scrapped, uh, et cetera, uh, it didn't really map that well uh, with Figma. So we figured, okay, like there must be a reason for this, right? And when we talked to some of the designers, there was sort of this underlying uh, feeling that, oh, you know, there's another step I gotta do. It, it takes time and whatnot. And to be honest, again, like it still takes time. It's not that we completely remove that step because the, I think the biggest problem here is that it's still a manual process. Uh, if we could somehow connect, you know, like Jira and our ex experimentation platform and Figma so that this happened automatically, that would obviously be like the, the most amazing thing uh, ever done for a bigger team. Uh, but for the time being, uh, since that's not really possible, uh, we just need to figure out how to just shave off like all of the necessary time, um, even though it's manual. Yeah, okay, very interesting. And um, this person is intrigued by the term shipped uh, to developers. Can you expand on that? Mm -hmm. And how do you handle the fluid nature of the triad UX dev PO collaboration? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, uh, typically, at least for us, you know, we will usually align with our PMs on a design. Uh, what, okay, how to explain this? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like once I feel like, okay, this design is, uh, you know, satisfying all the requirements, uh, you know, it, it's ready to go on my point of view. Uh, we'll usually have the product manager to have a look at it. I'll, I'll typically use Jira to, to ship my designs. Again, after doing like those checks with the design systems team and everything. And if they indeed think that uh, this looks good to go, uh, then we consider it uh, shipped. But then what we usually have is um, we have, you know, like the scrum ceremonies where the developers will look at this and they will do the grooming. Uh, and at that point, uh, if they find that something was indeed uh, not really thought through 100%, uh, then we uh, can take that and just revert the status back to work in progress. But typically the way we do it is that we will change the status once it's kind of been agreed upon with our product manager. Uh, and because this, this doesn't always happen, you know, synchronous, like we, that might happen like on a Monday, but the grooming session might not be in two weeks from now uh, for this particular design, because we always want to make sure to be ahead of time, right? Um, so yeah, that's typically how we do it. Um, we did have more statuses in abstract because we did something similar before, but Again, it kind of came back to that thing, like how important is it that these statuses are like, you know, like super duper 100% accurate following every single step of the process versus, you know, people uh, actually using them because having too many statuses and being like a little bit uh, too strict with these things, people just sort of abandoned the whole idea altogether. So, mm. so yeah. Yeah, like you mentioned it, uh, too many processes, less adoption, isn't it? Um, yeah, exactly. And what is the ratio that you guys have at Agoda with UX, dev, and PO? <laughs> uh, what's the ratio? I'm not really sure. I think PMs and designers are probably similar, I would say. I think there are about the same amount of PMs and designers in our company. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, actually. Developers, for sure, there's more, a uh, couple of hundreds. I don't know what the actual number is, but uh, it also really depends. Like uh, the product that I'm working on, I'm working on packages and I'm working with four different Scrum teams on that. So in my particular case, that's quite a lot of developers to work with, uh, but some designers might work with a smaller team uh, and they might support only one Scrum team. So it really depends. Um, yeah, I don't really have the number. 
but <laughs> a lot of more developers than designers. That's <laughs> that's, that's the that rule, isn't sure. it? <laughs> <laughs> that's the rule. <laughs> yeah, that's how most people do it. And of course, uh, this is also a question very interesting for me because I'm right now starting the process of migrating. So how long did it take for your team to migrate Sketch to Figma? And was it seamless transition? Uh, yeah, it was definitely not seamless uh, and it definitely took a lot of time, but I don't know how to define that because I feel like there are still things that haven't been 100% migrated in terms of, like I said before, like applying all the auto layout and, and all those features. Uh, so I'm not sure if I would consider it like done yet, but I think uh, we got to a pretty good state in our team after maybe half year like six months, we got to a pretty good state. And then maybe another like three, four months, like where we sort of did a lot of these improvements where uh, it's not only like migrated, but it also kind of starts to work well. Uh, we solved uh, some of these issues that I mentioned before, uh, but it, it definitely took time. Um, yeah. Yeah, but then if you were to like give a, a ballpark, like a year, six months, to get where you're at. Yeah, maybe like, yeah, nine, 10 months, probably nine months, maybe. All right. From that's... when we kind of like started and where we are now, I think about nine months. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Very nice. And do you have one master file for web and one for app right now? Um, yes, we do uh, always split by platform. So. That's a very good question. Uh, for those projects where we do share uh, projects between the different platforms, even though they are shared, we usually have a separate file pinned to the top for web, uh, mobile, web, and uh, app. Yeah, that's the case. And as I said, some cases we actually have a separate team for each platform uh, as well, but the files are always separate. And for the same reason, like the, you know, having those libraries set up. Uh, by default and everything, uh, it just makes more sense uh, to do that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, um, we have a question in regards to like preparing the sketch files, but of course you mentioned before that you didn't really convert what you had in sketch, you just import it as a reference and then had to rebuild most of it, right? But um, did you yeah. prepare these sketch files for this initial um, transition or you just imported what you had? <laughs> so what we try to do, we try to sort of uh, for each, so we work with abstract, right? So on each project in abstract where we had a lot of, you know, open branches, uh, we try to reach out to each branch owner uh, to see, you know, is this project, because a lot of things was obsolete or they were uh, stale already. So we asked them, you know, is this something that you're actually going to build? Is it, has it already been integrated? So we try to get all our designers to either merge or delete their branches in abstract uh, in order to kind of get a better sense of what the master file was. Um, and then we set a deadline. So we said, you know, like by, I don't know, 1st of October or whatever we said, uh, we will take the master file from uh, abstract and we will import it into Figma. So it's up to you guys, you know, if uh, you do have uh, important design work on abstract that you want to be a part of this, uh, please do uh, merge it. Otherwise, you know, go right ahead and do it yourself <laughs> <laughs> because we do still have a year from, uh, a year later, we do still have abstract. Uh, uh, just in case someone needs to, you know, open a file or access one of those branches. It's just like a read-only mode or whatever. We don't really pay for it, but uh, the access is still there uh, if this happens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, we, we did have a designer who was on maternity leave for a year, <laughs> and that happened right before the transition. So she came back and she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, where are my designs? <laughs> I left with Sketch and I got back with Figma. So we're like, uh, yeah, you know, like, I'm pretty sure you'll still find it if you look through the branches, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah, and the importance of having everybody on board and, and watching what's happening at the same time, right? Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Funny situation. Yeah. So we, here goes the tip yeah, prepare for anybody who's out. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if people are on holidays as well, right? And, and the migration happens in two weeks and they're like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, 
I guess that's the benefit of the migration taking like almost a year. That's it's unlikely unless you're on maternity or paternity leave. It's probably unlikely that you're going to be out for that long. <laughs> but in this case, it did happen. Uh, but, but then yeah. when you were going through this migration, um, did uh, your designers have to handle Sketch, Abstract and Figma at the same time for a period of time? Uh, they so what kind of happened was that we did encourage every designer uh, for any new design effort so something that they hadn't already started in abstract uh, we encouraged them to create a new file on figma and get started from there so i think for quite a while there was definitely like two tools going on at the same time where any work that they had already shipped or that they had started and you know it was just a little bit far gone in order to start over again uh, then they would definitely ship it uh, with uh, Zeppelin and Sketch and Abstract. So yeah, for for I think for probably a couple of months, uh, because you know how it is. It's, it's not like everything is not a perfect process when you design and then you know ship it and everyone builds it and everything is perfect. Sometimes priorities change and things get put on hold. So we did have to come back sometimes. And, oh, damn! Like this one was still on Abstract, and then each designer had to decide whether they wanted to move it over right ahead to Figma or if they wanted to ship it still on uh, Sketch. Knowing that if this gets successful and integrated, you will have to redo it on Figma anyways. So that was kind of a good uh, incentive for them to spend that little extra time each time and do it in Figma, yeah. And do you think there was a big learning curve for uh, the designers to get used to Figma as the new tool or was it like instant? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the the feedback. So we did actually run a survey uh, with our design team, which you will find in the third article on my Medium series. <laughs> uh, and that's uh, um, that survey. It was like unanimously positive response. The team find it uh, very easy to get used to the tools themselves. And that's kind of also why I didn't focus this uh, talk on like inside of the files because that stuff people knew how to do. And either way, I, I think people can learn tools, you know, there are like tutorials, you spend a day or two and you kind of get most of it already, especially the other design tools. Uh, so no, the, the, the team was very satisfied with the product itself. The bigger challenge was more, how do we structure everything now that we don't have branches and, you know, now that we have to redo everything. Mm -hmm. No, and I think it, it was a great uh, option that you uh, decided to go for this explanation for this talk, because indeed, yeah, people can also follow existing Figma files to see how the, those things are structured. And it's good to see the behind uh, the screen, behind the curtains on, yeah, the, the inner gritties and the thing that nobody wants to do, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm also taking a look at time right now. We, do, we did intend to have a 15 minute break in between talks so people can uh, go to the toilet or Sylvia and I can also, you know, take some water. Um, but Alex is just so easy to keep asking you a question and there's so much that I'm sure me <laughs> and everybody wants to know. We do have some more items uh, in the mirror board. So if you have some time later on and you would like to answer those questions in a comment or however you prefer in a post-it, uh, please do so, uh, of course, and people uh, make sure to reach out to Alex um, on LinkedIn, Twitter, read his Medium posts. That's definitely uh, worth it. <laughs> and it was it was really a pleasure yeah. having you around. Thank you so much for your time, Alex. It was lovely. All right, thank you.